Hello everyone. Welcome to the second lesson in our series, Waves in the Real World. In lesson one, we reviewed some of the terms used to describe waves. We found waves that formed on a string or in a slinky are two-dimensional waves and showed that in the real world, waves have three dimensions. We considered a water wave as an example of a 3D wave and showed that water waves behave in the same way as 2D waves at a boundary. Water waves can be reflected at a boundary or refracted when moving from deep to shallow water. In this lesson, we will focus on a property of waves we have not considered before, diffraction. We will observe diffraction when water waves in a ripple tank bend around a barrier and pass through a gap or slit in the barrier. We will then use a principle called Huygens' principle to explain why diffraction takes place. Later in the lesson, we will use a laser to investigate the diffraction of light. When a laser light is shone through a very thin slit in a barrier, a diffraction pattern is formed. We will explore the relationships between the size of the slit, the wavelength of the light, and the diffraction patterns formed. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to use Huygens' principle to predict the shapes of wave fronts at a barrier. Apply your knowledge of constructive and destructive interference to explain the diffraction pattern formed when laser light is shone through a thin slit and use the relationship between the wavelength of the light and the width of the slit to calculate the angle of diffraction. In the first lesson in our series, you learned that a three-dimensional wave has a wave front which is at right angles to the direction of propagation of the wave. Remember, a wave front shows all the points of the wave that are in phase with one another. So, on this diagram, showing the top view of a water wave, we can represent all the points on the same wave crest as a straight line. A scientist called Christian Huygens came up with a way of predicting what the shape and position of the next wave front will be. This is called Huygens principle. This principle says that we can think of every point on a wave front as a source of secondary wavelets. Let's apply Huygens principle to this wave front to show the shape and position of the next wave front after a few seconds. Remember, a small vibrating source produces circular waves that radiate outwards. So, if we apply Huygens principle to all the points of a wave front, we can draw in little circles around each point to represent the wavelets formed by each point. The radii of all the circles are the same, showing that all the wavelets move at the same speed and so will have moved the same distance in the same time. Now notice that one line can be drawn as a tangent to all these circles. The tangent shows the boundary of the region that contains all the little wavelets. Huygens said that the tangent line represents the new wavefront. Now let's use Huygens' principle to predict what a wavefront will look like for a wave that moves past a barrier. Do you notice here that some of the points on the wavefront are blocked by the barrier? This causes the shape of the new wavefront to be curved at the point where the barrier has cut off some of the point sources. The curvature of the wavefront as it passes a barrier is called diffraction. We can clearly see diffraction taking place when we place a barrier in a ripple tank. Now, watch what happens when I add another barrier so that the wave passes through a gap. Do you see that the wavefront is now curved on both sides? This happens because point sources on both ends of the wavefront are blocked, and so the wavefront is curved on both sides. Now, watch what happens as we narrow the width of the gap. Can you see that the narrower we make the gap, the more the wave spreads out behind the gap. So we can see that the narrower the gap, 
the more the wave is diffracted as it passes through the gap. Notice that the diffraction pattern formed by the narrow gap is very similar to the ripple pattern formed by a single spherical vibrating source. Before we look at another interesting real-life occurrence of diffraction involving a laser beam, let's review what we know about the interference of waves. You should recall from another series that when two waves meet one another, their wave displacements add together at every point. This is called superposition. When the waves are in phase with each other, their peaks and their troughs coincide with one another. Here we have two crests that are in phase with each other, moving toward each other. When they meet, they experience constructive interference and produce a crest that has a greater amplitude than the two separate crests. On the other hand, when waves that meet each other are out of phase, the peak of one wave coincides with the trough of the other. Here we have two crests that are out of phase with each other, moving towards each other. When they meet, they experience destructive interference and so cancel one another out. Keeping the ideas of constructive and destructive interference in mind, let's have a look at what happens when we shine a laser beam through a gap. Here the slit is quite wide and we see a red mark where the light from the laser is shining onto the screen. Clearly, the beam has passed through the slit without being diffracted. Now, look carefully at what happens to the red mark as we narrow the slit. Here we see a surprising result. We see a bright red patch in the middle with darker patches called fringes on each side of it and then more bright patches further out. This pattern of bright red patches and dark fringes is evidence that light was diffracted when passing through the slit. The pattern formed on the screen is a diffraction pattern. Let's now use what we know about waves to work out why we see this particular diffraction pattern. We start by applying Huygens' principle to the wave front that arrives at the slit. Huygens' principle says that each point on this wave front is the source of secondary wavelets. Let's examine what happens when these wavelets meet one another at the screen. Some of the wavelets arrive in phase with one another. In other words, the crests are together and the troughs are together. When this happens, we know that constructive interference takes place. So at these positions on the screen, we will see bright patches. Some of the wavelets are out of phase with one another when they reach the screen. In other words, the crest of one wave is at the same position as the trough of the other. When this happens, destructive interference takes place. So at these positions on the screen, we will see dark fringes. So when we see a diffraction pattern, the places that are bright are the positions on the screen where constructive interference has taken place and the dark fringes are the places where destructive interference has taken place. We can actually work out where these light patches and dark fringes will be formed on the screen. In this diagram, the slit has a width of A. The wave has a wavelength of lambda. We can draw a line from the first dark fringe to the middle of the slit to meet a horizontal line drawn from this point towards the screen. The angle between these lines is labeled theta1 on the diagram. Scientists have proved that the angle theta1 is given by the equation theta1 equals lambda divided by a. In the same way, we can draw in a line between the second dark fringe and the horizontal line to form the angle theta2. The equation for this angle is theta2 equals 2 lambda divided by a. Similarly, 
angle theta minus 1 that is formed below the horizontal is given by the equation theta minus 1 equals minus lambda over a. We can combine these equations together to give us a general equation for the angle theta for any dark fringe. This equation is theta m equals m times lambda divided by a, where m can be any positive or negative integer value corresponding to the position of a dark fringe. See if you can use this equation to solve the following problem. The wavelength of red light is 720 nanometers. If this light is shone onto a slit that has a width of 600 nanometers, calculate the angle theta 1 corresponding to the angle of the first dark fringe above the horizontal line. Let's go through it together. We can use the equation theta 1 equals plus 1 times lambda divided by a. If we insert the given values into this equation, we find that the value of the angle is 1,2 degrees. Now that we know the angle to the first dark fringe, we can use trigonometry to calculate the distance from the center of the bright patch on the screen to the first dark fringe if we also know the distance between the slit and the screen. See if you can solve this problem. If the distance between the slit and the screen is 20 centimeters, what is the distance, d, between the central bright patch and the first dark fringe? Let's work through this problem together. In this right-angled triangle, the length d is opposite to the angle theta 1, so we can use the sine function to find it. We know that the sine of an angle is equal to the opposite side of the triangle divided by the adjacent side. So the sine of 1,2 degrees is equal to the length d divided by 20 centimeters. We use this equation to solve for d and find that the distance between the central bright patch and the first dark fringe is 0,42 centimeters. Well, after these calculations, I think you're ready for today's task. Instead of passing a red laser light, which has a wavelength of 720 nanometers, through a slit with a width of 600 nanometers, we pass a blue laser light, which has a wavelength of 500 nanometers, through the same slit. What differences would you notice between the diffraction patterns of red and blue light? You'll need to do some calculations to support your ideas. The information in this table should be enough to get you started. Thank you for joining me today. In our next lesson, we will explore what happens to the wave fronts of a wave that encounters two slits that are next to each other. Yeah.